You're welcome back. Uh, it's still the breakfast on Plus TV Africa. And right now, we want to lift off the press, the headlines that are making the rounds this morning. Uh, we're starting with uh, one of the national dailies, Nature News. Uh, Nature News leads with the story, state governors ready for the worst, seek federal government's intervention. And the writer there is uh, Senator uh, Makes Case for Anambra Gali. Uh, then we have also Nigeria Marks World Population Day pledges to promote gender equality. Government bans metal scavenging, or metal scavenging rather, amid security concerns. Then, Ben way to train farmers on new farming methods and technologies. Meanwhile, uh, Lumelu joins world leaders to mobilize climate finance for Africa. Okay, uh, we will move from uh, Nature News to the Punch newspaper for other headlines. Okay, we have the Nation rather. So we'll take the Nation now. The Nation newspaper leads with Adamu's incapacitation talk uh, sparks row over Akeredulu. Rider is on those state PDP raises dust. Deputy Governor says, I spoke with him on Sunday. And then we also have on top of that, Mustafa bin Tube. Okay, uh, we may not need that. Uh, no minister's list yet, says APC. No minister's list yet. The list we've all been waiting for and speculations have gone. Uh, no minister's list yet. Border reopening plan in progress, says Customs CG. And finally, uh, Senate to investigate 93 trillion naira spent on petrol subsidy in 30 months. All right, we'll leave uh, the nation right now to yet another newspaper. Possibly punch newspaper right now. Or the Guardian, let's take the Guardian at this point. The Guardian newspaper is leading with Akpabio, 13 senators to earn over 5.6 billion Naira ex-governor's pensions benefit. So they will be in the Senate and still be earning ex-governor's benefit. Tinubu breaks silence, orders arrest of Plateau, Benwe killings, masterminds. Coalition sacks remain. Gado sack uh, revisit the 2006 report on Kwankoso. FMDQ introduces exchange traded uh, derive, derivatives market. And then we have reps tackle banks over illegal deductions, incriminate or indiscriminate charges. About time. Separating empowerment projects from first ladies' vanities. Okay, that is a story you might want to read on The Guardian as well this morning. Okay, those are not all the headlines, but uh, those are the ones we can take for now on The Guardian. When you get a copy, you get to read more uh, other stories. And then the final paper this morning is the Punch newspaper. Uh, so on the Punch newspaper, some of the headlines there are saying Nigerian students face tough times in the UK. Tuition soars by 60%. Um, those are some of the things because of the Naira devaluation, as they say. Um, they say the writers there are new forex rate threatens overseas students indebted scholars barred from classes, and then parents beg federal government for concession in tuition, leaving costs climb amid forex crisis. Then we also have uh, SEC investigates or two decos FBN share acquisition. PDP governors demand a credible polls in Bielsa, Imo, and Kogi, and then APC crisis deepens as omissory labels Lukman black sheep. 
Mm. Interesting times. Okay, uh, panel storms or Tom's automobile workshop impounds vehicles. People who saw the videos said the, the number of cars taken there were, was something else. Okay, uh, well, that's the much we can take from the punch as well. Uh, there are so many headlines that we need to uh, talk about this morning. And I'm glad that we are being joined by a legal practitioner here in Lagos State in the person of Mr. Tunde Kolaole. Mr. Kolaole, good morning and welcome to the program. Yeah, I don't know where we're going to start. Uh, maybe we'll start from Ondo State where, uh, I don't know if that is Ondo State we're starting from or that is APC we're starting from. Adamu once again has made a comment that has sparked some outrage, some uh, uh, mixed reactions from Nigerians, this time around, especially from the Ondo state government uh, now. So the statement was that Akere Dolu was incapacitated, and that statement have, has been uh, debunked. They say that statement was wrong, and on the other hand, they were saying that statement was taken out of context. I'd like to get your thoughts on what is happening in Ondo state and in the APC by implication. But well, first and foremost, um, I would like to sympathize with uh, Governor Akele Tolu. And nobody wants or would like to be sick. Mm. So when they are sick, we should not uh, begin to deride them, ridicule them, taunt them, or be happy of their predicament. He is a father, he is a husband, he is an uncle and then the governor of the state. A lot of people are looking forward towards him for their well-being and then for peace and security in those states. And then you will realize that uh, the wife was supposed to celebrate the 70th birthday uh, within this uh, month and the wife has cancelled it because of uh, the sickness of, uh, of the husband. The truth of the matter is that there is no doubt that Mr. Kerry de Lou is sick. Yeah. And even he himself has compounded, he relocated abroad for treatment, and then handed over the reign of power to his deputy. That is a confirmation that all is not well uh, with him. The only thing that is causing this argument is the word incapacitation, mm -hmm. whether it is incapacitated or not. And I would want to say that uh, Senator Adamu hasn't said anything extraordinary uh, for us to start uh, uh, making this wound and uh, cry over the governor's help. If the governor is not incapacitated, if he has the capacity to do his job, he probably will not have relocated abroad and voluntarily handed over power to his deputy. So, to the extent that he has done what the Constitution expects him to do, that is when you are unable to discharge the functions of your office, you hand over to your governor. I don't think we should begin to make too much noise about it. Rather, we should be praying for Governor Kelly to look to get well soon so as to be able to get back to the job. One of the one of the reasons or one of the things, provisions in the constitution to for someone to cease from being a governor is when he becomes incapacitated. That's the word that was used. So uh, Adamu saying this uh, must have been interpreted by a lot of people as uh, having reached that stage where he should no longer be the governor. He should be removed and replaced. Uh, maybe there's everything in terminology when it comes to interpreting constitutional matters, and possibly that's what the people are kicking against. So you as a lawyer, as a legal practitioner, um, should the word have been used? We know he's ill, which is normal. Anybody can be ill, and I don't know why it's a, such a big deal in Nigeria when you get ill and nobody needs to know and all that. But everybody can be ill. But are there some words that are more weighty because of how they are represented in the Constitution? I just want to learn that as well. Well, 
Let's remember something. Our politicians are very mischievous people. Different people or different politicians will give different interpretations to the world incapacitated. Those who are in support of the governor will not want such a word to be used. Because when it is used, it is a kind of call, just like you yourself have said, for the governor to be replaced. Whereas those who want him out of the place, or probably would like to step into his shoes, will not see anything wrong. In fact, they will be happy with the word that Adamu has used. The truth of the matter is that uh, before you can declare the government capacitated, there are constitutional provisions that must be followed. You must make a complaint to the Indo State Assembly. The Indo State Assembly must set up a medical panel to examine the governor. I think about seven of them or the other about. And the governor's personal physician must himself be part of that panel who will examine the governor and give a report that the governor is incapa permanently incapacitated and that he might not be able to return back to his work. So when that happens, the processes of replacing him with the deputy governor will commence. Mark the word that I've used, permanently incapacitated, you know, as of today, we don't have any genuine, incontrovertible medical report that says that the governor might not get well soon. And also remember that in the constitution, in the civil service rules and regulations, and some other instance most of the land, people are entitled to a certain number of days for medical treatment, either here in Nigeria or abroad. If after a has been exhausted, those number of days within which he could be absent from his duty post on health grants, then the industrial assembly can also begin the processes of replacing him with his deputy through, a, through the composition of a medical panel that will examine the governor I report back to the House of Assembly for his replacement. But like I said, a lot of controversy you only go without them. You remember when the governor, I think it was Paraba State, had the plane crash that he was driving mm. and he became uh, incapacitated. There was a lot of noise. As you get the way, you could continue in office or you could not continue. And all manners of controversies were raised. The talks got settled when the governor eventually uh, died. In fact, in his own in his own case, he didn't hand over properly, or he was not even in the position to hand over power to his deputy before he had the accident or when he became sick. So let's keep our fingers crossed. Okay, um, just another matter from that same Ondo State uh, saga. From the Ondo State Commissioner yeah. for Information and Orientation, Bamidele uh, Ademola, uh, he, he said yeah. something that, that struck me. <clears throat> he said, and I quote, okay. he is evidently not in any critical state that should warrant his clearly reprehensible conduct as he still sent a post to the Executive Council Committee platform yesterday. That's what the Commissioner of Information and Orientation in Ondo State said. And my, my question is, yeah. if a governor hands over or a president hands over to the deputy, is he under any obligation to still send posts to the executive uh, platform? Should, she, should he still be superintending over the affairs of the state. We remember when uh, President, former President Muhammad Buhari was in London, we were told that he was signing 
some things into law, signing some documents in London while he was taking a medical leave. Should that happen, what would the deputy be doing no. who is now a governor? No, that is totally wrong. Uh, there is no doubt about it. Once you have handed over, you will stay away from further discharging your duty as a governor. Mm. The deputy is a de facto governor of Ondo um, State today, and all box must stop at his uh, table. But the truth of the matter is that, uh, like uh, we had earlier on said, here, politicians convert power so much and they behave like gods. It's as if uh, when they are not there, the roof or heavens will collapse over the, their people's uh, heads. Where yeah, that experience has shown that when the governor has passed on, or when the governor leaves office, there are a hundred and thousand other Nigerians that can effectively step into their shoes and discharge the responsibilities of the office. If Governor Kerentolu is still uh, sending messages and giving directives from the sick bed, he is contravening the laws of the land and showing disrespect to the acting governor from those things. Well, uh, let's move on from there. Uh, there is this headline also. Uh, this is from the Guardian newspaper. Aquabio, uh, 13 senators to earn over 5.6 billion naira ex-governor's pensions and benefits. Let me have your take. Uh, we've seen Benga Daniel, for instance, saying that they should stop giving him his pensions and all that. Uh, but there are other governors that are still collecting. You collect from from as a retired governor, uh, and then you collect from the Senate as well. You collect from everywhere collectible. So I, I don't know. Let me have your legal <laughs> comments to, to that, please. Well, it is very wrong. When you look at uh, uh, that money, wrong how? Morally it's coming or, from one source. Morally or legally? Which is, you said? You said it is wrong. Is it morally wrong or legally wrong? Morally and legally wrong. You see, you, when you are in, uh, when you become a senator as uh, a former governor, what you expected to do is to elect which one they would like to be taken, whether they are pension or the salary and the monument of a senator. The law does not envisage that people will begin to draw the salaries of uh, a retired governor and then the salaries and allowances and emolument of a city senator. It is when they probably have left the Senate and they are no longer occupying any remunerated offices that they can now begin to collect their pensions as a former governor. I think one of the lawyers, whose name I can't remember today, went to the Federal High Court to contest this double payment to some of these former governors. And the Federal High Court has ruled that it is unlawful for them to be earning these double salaries as a former governor and then as a senator. And nobody has appealed that decision of the Federal High Court. So to that extent, and that is the reason why I say it is unlawful. Because any decision of our court or any judgment of the court that is not overturned by the Supreme Court becomes law, which is binding not just on the governors or former governors and then the senators, but on all Nigeria. It is both morally and legally wrong. We don't begin to earn two salaries because they are all coming from the same revenues of the Federation.
the consolidated revenues of the federation. Thank you. Yeah, we have this story. Yeah. Um, we have the story on Nature News. Nature News, the major story, the flood. State governors ready for the worst. Seek federal government's intervention. Uh, as a senator makes case for Anambra Gully, that's uh, the erosion in Anambra State, which is really a worrisome uh, situation. But now, flood, state governors ready for the wars and seek federal government's intervention. I'd like your comment on that. When you watch your foreign television, what is happening in different parts of the world with regards to flooding is very, very frightening. They have had flooding in Pakistan, in India, in US, and some different parts of the world, which points to the fact that the climate change that uh, the scientists have been talking about is real. When you also look at our situation here in Nigeria, we are beginning to have flooding in Abuja and some of these northern states. In the past, you could count the number of days that rain will fall in Abuja and some of these northern states. What this indicates is that the challenge is not just in some other parts of the world, but right here on our doorstep. So, with the governor, we read this in the newspaper, and we did say that they are ready, but I haven't seen anything to show that uh, the governor are really ready to tackle these uh, challenges. They say they are prepared. Well, in the place like Lagos, we could see that the Lagos state government is evacuating waste in all the drainages, gutters, and the rivers within the town to make a road for free flow of water when there is a heavy uh, rain. But then, I haven't seen this kind of, I have not heard about this kind of activity taking place in some other parts of uh, Nigeria. And uh, furthermore, the countries that are preparing for this flooding, they are building safe houses, they are stockpiling food, they are getting ready all manners of uh, emergency evacuation a program on ground to be able to help their people when frozen actually takes place. I haven't seen any of that taking place in Nigeria. With regards to Anambra and the Southeast, there is no doubt that they have uh, serious challenges with regards to erosion. I'll give you an example. I was reading the paper uh, two days ago in which there was a report that the house of the former vice president, Mr. Leze Kweme, is gradually being swept away by erosion. He told some of these other people's houses, both the big people and the ordinary man on the street. So, all manners of money has been voted to fight erosion in the southeast, but we haven't seen any concrete results with regard to money that has been appropriated to fight that uh, environmental uh, disaster or tragedy or challenges. So the governor required to do more if they don't want us to experience the kind of thing that has happened in Pakistan, in India, in Indonesia, even in Japan, where tens of people have been swept away by flood water. Okay, um, let's move on to the Nation newspaper. On the Nation newspaper, we've seen a story that was also on the headlines yesterday, but I'd like your legal perspective to it. Intercepted vessel uh, destroyed in Delta with 150,000 million uh, tons, uh, 150,000 tons of uh, crude worth $86.8 million. A vessel was mm. intercepted and it was destroyed with this crude inside. Just tell me, oh. how will these people be prosecuted the, in the first place if the evidence has been destroyed? 
a very strange decision that uh, it's the not government the first time it has been happening. or that the people have done this have taken it's like uh, you are destroying your own asset your crew was stolen and then you got it rather than evacuate the crew and selling it so that you can make some money from there and put in the national conference you choose to burn the crew and then you also burn the vessel when you can go to court and seek another of our court for the thieves of the Kura and the owners of those ships to forfeit the ship to the Nigerian Federation. And then when you have gotten another forfeiture, you can sell the ship and use it to kind of uh, recoup some of your losses as a nation. You now burn the ship. Furthermore, when you burn a ship, with that kind of megaton or metric tons of uh, petroleum product inside it, you are causing an environmental uh, problem, environmental disaster. The film that we generated, the fuel that will go into the Atlantic Ocean, will affect the ecology of that area. Fishes and other ocean animals and birds will be adversely affected by that decision. So honestly speaking, that decision to burn the ship with the petroleum products inside it is rather very strange. And people looking at us from abroad will want to say that the decision is very um, and stupid. And that the decision may even be a way to cover up those who are behind the theft of those uh, crude uh, oil products and also the owners of the ship that has been burned. Whichever way you look at it, it's not a very appropriate decision for the people who have done this to take. Okay, uh, FMDQ introduces exchange traded uh, derivatives market. I don't even understand what that is. Do you have an idea? Well, uh, it's those who are familiar with uh, the operations of the Nigerian Stock Exchange, the buying and selling of stocks, and also some of these uh, federal government uh, financial instruments that will be able to explain that to us in detail. You know, the commonly listed on the Nigerian Stock Exchange. They engage in buying and selling of shares every day. The state government, the federal government, they also sell bonds. The CBN sells bonds, which people buy, which people sell, and then which at the end of the day becomes their money. They are called financial instruments and what have you. Whatever the federal government has to do, whatever steps the federal government has to do, so really, ameliorate the dwindling fortunes of the Naira, I think it should be welcome. Whatever efforts they have to make okay. to make sure that the inflation, the hyperinflation that we have in the country today, the skyrocketing of prices of goods and services is brought down, I think should be welcomed by everybody. Okay. And we should support the government in that uh, direction. Okay. But if you ask me, as a socialist, I would rather want to see a situation in which our economy is not left to the vagary of uh, demand and supply to the World Bank's uh, dictates, and then to just simply market forces. There is nowhere in the world that market forces alone determine the circumstances in the nation's economy. And the Chinese have been able to prove one thing, that uh, you can have an economy totally dominated 
and managed by the central government, and then such economy will still be doing well, that it will not have the kind of inflation, the kind of unemployment, the kind of skyrocketing prices that we have in our hands. So it's becoming a fallacy that the government lacks the capacity and the necessary way with us to manage an economy or businesses, that all businesses should be left to businessmen, businessmen and women alone to do. China has been able to prove that that is a lie. China is one of the fastest growing economies today. Scientifically, they are also one of the fastest uh, growing. And yet, the commanding heights of that economy is dominated by the central government. Okay, uh, let's go back to the nation. As the final um, question this morning, uh, no minister's list yet, says APC. Remember that... Um, even some names have come out. A lot of people have, have fingered so many other people that are going to make the ministerial list. And tentatively, there was this talk that the list was out. Now the APC is telling us that the list is not out yet. Um, we don't know when to expect it because no definite timeline has been given. Even though they say uh, 60 days, uh, we'll have the minister's list and all that. And there seems to be a delay here and there, some kind of cracks here and there, some kind of scrutiny here and there. Uh, what do you think about the fact that at this point, we are being told that the minister's list is not out? Not that it will not be presented yet, or it has not been presented, but it is not out at all. With, uh, by law, President Tinubu has the right or power to keep that uh, to his chest uh, for now. But we collect that uh, when President Muhammad Buhari first came into power and he didn't appoint ministers for almost one year, the National Assembly learned some lessons from that and then the bill was taken to the National Assembly which was passed into law. Now anybody who become president or any government that comes to power must ensure that they appoint um, the ministers within six months, I think, of being in power. With what we have in our hands today, President Bola Tinubu has not exceeded that provisions of the law. So to that extent, he could still be thinking and then pondering and assessing whoever he wants to uh, appoint as a minister and his government. Okay. But we must also remember All right. that we engage in party politics, and this is a democracy. People are free to lobby. It's a thing that is acceptable in a democracy. Party leaders, whether at the federal level or at the state level, are also expected to justice to be appointed as a minister. Okay. So a lot of variables go into appointing a minister in a democratic environment, such as we have in Nigeria today. A lot of interest will go into it. Okay. And that makes it very difficult for the president to just within a GC appoint minister. Okay. A lot of people work right. for me to be able to get to the office of the president. All right. Uh, One way or the other, there must be a payback time. Okay. Like I've always said, what is important is that uh, the president must ensure that given the challenge we have in our hands, it is a square peg in a square hole that he appoints as a minister. All right. If he fails to do that, the job will be made very, very difficult for him as a president. Okay. And then we undermine his success. Thank and then you. it will undermine his ability Thank to you. deliver the dividend of democracy. Thank you, Tunde. Thank you so much. Um, that's the much we can take on off the press this morning. Thank you, Tunde Kolawole, for coming on the show. 
Okay, we were talking with uh, Mr. Tunde Kolawole, legal practitioner here in Lagos State, and we were dealing with some of the headlines on our national dailies that we were lifting up the press this morning. Uh, we will take a very, very short break, and when we return, we'll be talking about how the federal government intends to double government revenue without imposing more taxes. Stay with us.